Oh, we got a good fire burning over there. We're going to have to get over there, too. What we're doing out here is we're burning these rice fields off, and uh, we're getting rid of the, the stubble. We're not going to get rid of all the stubble, but we are trying to reduce the amount of it because rice straw has a lot of silica in it. It doesn't really contribute a lot to organic matter. A lot of the organic matter comes out of the roots and all, which we're not going to destroy those. I'm going to go down, I'm going to loop this field and start this side, probably come down the middle. We may make two passes through the center and then we're going to go far side and then we'll let it create its own wind and it'll sweep across this field and we'll be done with it. So, you know, we're going to keep going, uh, getting a little smoky where we're at. So we'll just keep on moving and we'll burn some more and talk about it again here in a minute. I've got a gut feeling this is going to be a good year. The farmer is the eternal optimist. We farm together as a family. If we all put our heads together, I don't know what we couldn't achieve. Hopefully we hit 90 bushel. I think we could do it. Just have healthy plants and a good return on investment. One of the worst things about farming is making a decision on planting depth. A quarter of an inch on your depth sometimes, you won't get a stain. As you can see, my pinky ring's empty, so obviously I didn't win. <laughs> With this class of guys that's in Podfathers, I mean, anyone could win. We've got rain coming. These fields have got to be worked. We rutted them up during harvest. It rained on us about every two or three days, it seemed like. We're just reducing the amount of biomass. People want to say, you know, well, with all this smoke going up in the atmosphere, that's a terrible thing. It's a lot of pollution. But the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere with this smoke is so much less than if we were to leave all this straw out here and to allow it to decompose over winter in this, in this water. And, and through the fall in this water and heat and the greenhouse gases, you know, the carbon uh, dioxide or carbon monoxide uh, emissions that would be given off during this period of time. I don't like it, but I do like the fact that it's, you know, it's done, it's gone, it doesn't sit here all winter and uh, hurt the environment more than what we do. Sun's out and the wind's blowing. The day's not that great, to be honest with you. I'm messing with him. It's been kind of hazy and the moisture's high. So we'll just do the best we can. I'm gonna do whatever I'm told. I don't know exactly what I'm gonna do today. So what's going on today, and we had 1,600 acres of beans desiccated. So we felt like we would be majorly cutting when y'all got here. We started cutting yesterday again had five machines in there, and moisture started out pretty good and got up as far as 18%, so we had to completely stop everything. We finally hunted a 90-acre field down we could cut, but then basically we cut everything that was of the right moisture to go to the elevator yesterday. We had five machines and 13 trucks, and all of a sudden you stop and go to trying to hunt another field of cut, so everybody's asking questions, and. When are we going to start? Where do we need to park? What are we going to do here? And you can't answer all those, you know, because you don't know what you're going to do either. And so it kind of puts you in a little tizzy there when, when that happens. When during harvest, every hour we're setting costs us probably six or seven hundred dollars. If we have to stop for an hour and everybody's sitting idle, it's probably six or seven. At minimum, I'd say is that much. <clears throat> so that's why I'm kind of a fanatic about making sure everything's moving all the time. All right, so let's go to the bins. I gotta get some tickets ready so we can dump some trucks. Let's go there, then we'll go from there to the field. At the church lot right now, it's all the harvest equipment 
and all of the litter crew equipment, Sarah. Oh, yeah, That's absolute. That. There ain't a no place you put nothing in that lot right now. I would say 95% of the corn's cut in this area. Probably not even a half percent of the soybeans are harvested. Zero cotton. But I would say probably 60% of the rice is cut. So it's been going pretty good. You know, I'd have come through here, didn't really do the damage that was expected. So we were very blessed with that. What you got there? Some fried chicken. Did you get me any? Well, yeah, I always bring you food, don't I? I'm Regina Boyd. I do the plots. I do soil sampling. I do tissue sampling. I do just about anything I'm asked to do pretty much. I've been here six years. On soil sampling? Just on soil sampling. We just kept adding stuff to her job. Now she's got more to do than any of us do. Now, what we're cutting today is just some of our normal production ground. <clears throat> That's all we got, you know, really available with the moisture not too high. Yeah. It sounds like we're bragging, but we've got the most 95 bushel and acre fields I've ever seen. You, the whole field will cut 95, but you can't find a 100 bushel block. And, but that's way better, in my opinion, than having an 80 acre, field, 80 bushel and acre field and find a 100 acre, 100 bushel spot. Got, they're trying to put out our litter and we got all of our stuff parked in the field. Estes Concaves has made a big difference for us. I would safely say we've increased our capacity by a thousand bushel per hour. Guaranteed to get it done right there. I will win. Give Estes a try. I'm very fortunate that I've been working with Concept Agritech now for four years. We have 12 Concept Agritech plots out right now. Man, this is like drinking water. It does that much for you. So this is where the intercropping was last year. So 60 foot corn, 120 foot beans, 60 foot corn, 120 foot beans. So on some of this ground, it's beans after beans. And uh, what I can't get over is just a yield difference between running after beans and then running where it's after corn. There's a pretty big significant yield difference between that so far. I'm really surprised by it. You know, we, we, we always knew that there was a loss by going beans after beans, but uh, I, I guess I just didn't imagine it was this drastic of a loss. And if you didn't know, I mean, there's still really good beans, don't get me wrong. So I guess if you never had a side-by-side -side to see really what it is, you never think anything was wrong. You just thought, you know, that's the best we, we could do this year. But kind of having this odd intercropping field from last year, you know, we're, we're getting to see a true side-by-side -side of, you know, beans following corn and, and uh, beans following beans. So it's it's been a real interesting uh, trial, I guess you can call it. Some of the best trials are the ones that you never meant for trial. But uh, we're going to get a lot of good, uh, a lot of good data from it this year. This is where we did the crosshatch with the sundial plot this year for the beans, the contest beans. Uh, I think it was July 28th is when we had the uh, the bad windstorm come through. Uh, we lost the grain bin right over there to our left. Actually, three grain bins. We also got four inches of rain in a matter of no, no time. This field was looking great. It's still yielding really, really good. I'm not trying to complain, but when you look on the ground, you just see all the branching, all the stems that fell off. And we immediately seen that once we started walking the film after the storm. 
They were all just broke down. So they is a full R3 going, going into R4, about the worst time possible you could ever have a windstorm come in. When we was walking this field earlier this year, you know, we were showing you guys all the branching and how, how well it was looking all the way through. And you can see the scars on the beans where all the branching were. Now they're just single line beans, pods only on one side. That's from when they get blown over by the wind and they're pushed over like this, they only get sunlight to one side. So when beans cannot capture and they're shaded over, this is what happened. So then you know we're still getting a good yield. It really makes you wonder what could have been from it. Like I said, we, we had a good year with Mother Nature. It was just one storm. You know, the people from, from, from the Dur Echo out in Iowa last year, I mean, they, they had it a lot worse and there's been a lot, you know, worse windstorms to hit. But uh, this is just one where we had to contest beans and one where I really didn't want a windstorm to happen. But it definitely did. But uh, I, I think we'll still be okay with it. I'm, I'm so happy with it. What we're looking for, you know, ah, is a cluster of beans per node like this. You know, that's really what we're looking for. We want five, six, seven, eight pods per node on these. And uh, when they're laid over and they're shaded, they just can't get sunlight. Sunlight's what's gonna make the beans. So these went down early. They what would be called lodge, but it's not lodged from population or anything like that, just from wind. There's just wind blown over. So uh, that would be our limiting factor this year with this field. We do have a couple other fields that are looking really, really good. So uh, if this one doesn't pan out, then I think we've got a couple backups. We've had some pretty good beans within the years past, and this was by far something that I've never seen before. So to lose it, you know, just stinks. You know, they're competitive in you. You know, just want to do the best you can. It just stinks watching it go down. And having to watch it go down, I've actually been dreading harvesting in this field. I'm actually ready to just get it over with so I don't have to drive by it every single morning because I literally go to the shop down this laneway every single morning. And uh, I was so excited and then it turned into a real, uh, real sombering drive, so I'm ready just to quit looking at it, tired of looking at the flat beans, get it over with and move on. One of the bigger reasons this harvest has gone so much smoother is we got two Fent T9s over there. They've just been pumping the grain. They've done a great job. I've been very pleased with everything. We want the bottom canopy to be healthy with a good fungicide. We use Revitec on it. But on our farm, we got an average of six bushel better with the Revitec fungicide than any other fungicide. Like I said, very few times do you meet people in your life that you can consider a hero to you or, or a, a mentor. Uh, we kind of got in this litter deal by mistake. We had a landowner that wanted to wanted some litter out, and I wasn't even going to fool with any chicken litter. I, you know, back then I was a little more closed-minded, not as open-minded to different kind of new agriculture techniques. I was doing it like my dad done. And uh, we had a mutual friend that had chicken houses, and uh, Mike ended up uh, taking the business. <clears throat> Start with one litter buggy. How many you got now? Nine. Nine litter mm -hmm. buggies. Nice John Deere uh, tractors. He runs them on. Probably the best, most accurate litter applicator there is in this state. I'd say in the, in the Delta. Litter is something you can't measure like you can synthetic fertilize. You just got to hope it comes out right. And you've got to have someone that's really behind each application knowing that it's coming out right and adjusting and tweaking. And not only is it great for the crops, but it's helping the environment too by getting rid of a byproduct that normally would have to. Now, what they do with it? With, with well, I mean, they put it on feet. pastures and got too much phosphate, and polluted the streams, and yeah, so know, it, it was overblown in one area.
You know, I consider Matt the most loyal ally and friend and honorable man that I've ever dealt with. And we have never had a disagreement about a dollar in that time frame. And that's pretty awesome. What happens when you love somebody and do the right thing every time? We're gonna be preaching a little bit. All right, I'm gonna get on the cart. You're gonna go over and jump on the combine, right? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna pick me out a cart. One thing I've got is a great family of people that, that get this done. This ain't nothing that I do. With this, this operation wouldn't run without them, I can promise you that. So this guy right here is a huge part of the success of this farm. This is A.J. Bowling. I know you don't like being on camera, but I told him he was gonna come in here and surprise you. And I also figured up right now today you have 360 tires rolling. So he has to keep all those going, all the flats fixed, all the air conditioners going, and listen to all the complaints. Whatever you need done, that man can get it done. So we've been through a lot together, I will tell you that. If I get, if I get in a bind, if you get in a bind, you need to go to war, you get in the trenches, take AJ with you. He's a family, he's not just a friend, he's family. You see how dirty he is, that's, his, that's what he likes to do. I mean, if he ain't under a piece of equipment and he's clean, something's wrong. I'll just tell you, if he ain't got grease somewhere on him, something's wrong. Or he's asleep. One of the two. That's what I stress so much and what I love so much about my job is the family atmosphere, the people, the dedication. And then, I mean, Rob's standing behind you. He's, he sacrifices his family for this operation. You know, everybody does. I was telling him the other day, my goal in life is when I die, for there be standing room only in the funeral. That means I made a difference in somebody's life or they wouldn't be there. If there's standing room only in my funeral when I die, then 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 y'all will know that, you know, I may or may not see it, but y'all will know that I felt like that was my goal in life. With the Soybeans Terramax, we brought it out and instantly, man, I just couldn't believe the nodulation we had so early. If you haven't heard of them, you better get to know them because their products are here to play. We got some Monty's product. We use it in a lot of other crops. It's a changer. We focus on things that complement soil biology, things that complement soil health. It just keeps giving back. This, this was the best advertisement for ADS right here off this highway. You wouldn't believe the call. I get five or six calls a day from this highway when they started bringing this tile in. What the hell are you doing? Yeah, what are you doing? What's, has that gonna work? I said, well, I don't know if it's gonna work, but if it works, you're gonna wanna do it. Yeah. You know. Hey guys, uh, coming to you today from Deshea County, Arkansas, McGee. Uh, we got a real special project going on here, Lane and I do with uh, some underground drainage. Uh, it's called tile, pattern tile is actually what it's called. Uh, here with the Podfathers today. And uh, we've got another special guest coming. Uh, one of my really good friends is gonna come kind of check out what we're doing. He's very interested in doing the same thing. And there he is. What's up, dude? Hey. How are you? How's it going? Even well, though... the ride here was worse than the flight. <laughs> Even though he has a ponytail, he's one of my best friends. I'm gonna get that on out there right now. He's just now. jealous. Yeah, because I have nothing. Well, I'm excited about this project. I've been uh, considering this for years now, and I came down here, I want you to tell me all about it. ADS can explain what you can't explain to me. Uh, well, see, Chad had his installed this spring. So he's already got his in place and got a crop he's on it. He's got a jump on it. Is he happy yeah. with it? I haven't talked yeah, to him about so it. Yeah, so far he is, as far as I know. I hope this works because there's a lot of opportunity for tile in the South. <laughs> and having ADS to do it, I mean, they're kind of a household name to us, kind of like Walmart is yeah. to, 
to a regular person. So Been we're, around a while, very reputable. So yeah, we're excited yeah, about I'm, working I'm on I'm sure. Here. We're not only trying to drain it, but now we're going to see if we can pump water back in it with the lift station and, and irrigate out of it too. Got to be a win-win if it'll work. Yeah, so we'll, we'll go kind of lay it out on how it needs to set so that way you can get equipment back and forth. If the subsurface works, if the, if the irrigation works, we'll no longer have to have rows here. I want to see, you know, if you can subsurface irrigate rice, not flood it, but keep that soil soupy enough to where it's going to do the weed control you want, and then how much water are you able to save by not having a flood? Yeah, I'm really excited about this. It's going to look like a mess for a while, I'm afraid. 30 days. Everything will be completely settled in about 30 days. The thing about it is, if it doesn't work, we haven't lost anything. And, and if you don't try, you never know. That's right. Design done by Ecosystem Services Exchange, right? So we got 37 acres here. So this is where his well is. So this is where his water source is coming from. And this is the irrigation line we're putting in, correct? That is correct. And then we're tying in to the drain tile, technically, that we're gonna utilize in order to subsurface irrigate whatever crop we have on the field at this blue triangle, correct? That is correct. When we want it to flow this way, it's gonna flow this way, and then we want, we want it to backfill, it's gonna backfill. So whenever we're irrigating, this will be shut off, right? And it will backfill that way up. Just like filling the bottom levee on the rice field you were talking about earlier. Correct. This blue line right here is ground level, okay? And so the water's gonna dump into there. We'll be able to automatically, with our automation control, however we want to turn it on and off. So what we're gonna do, we'll set the water table. We said three feet for corn or soybeans. If we're going for rice, we'll set it right at, at surface level. And the water columns will basically fill, fill from the top side. So we'll turn it on. It'll go through our, our irrigation line. These water gates will be open and it'll actually feed down to the lift station and then the water will start to back up and we'll get to 12 inches here, that water gate will close and allow two feet to build up here, making a level, basically, water table. So it's, it's pushing through the main and then spreading out on those laterals across the field at the height that it's supposed to be based on the elevation that you have over your field. This will change the whole concept of sharky clay soils if it works. If the subsurface works, that's one of the problems we have with no-till is we've got to have that open furrow to irrigate. Well, if we're subsurfacing this, we don't need that, then we can go into more no-till. There's a lot of different sustainability practices we can use here that we can't use with it being Absolutely. Broken. You know what they're going to say. The next thing, it's always like, sharky clay is not like anybody else's soil. And Alan's like, look, dude, you got drainage. Now you can't be saying sharky clay is not like anybody else's soul. So exactly. you better get ready for your next excuse whenever. Yeah, yeah I won't have an excuse then. <laughs> I'm hoping I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Timing is always an issue. If you get the timing right and everything else seems to just fall into place. All of us are dying to know what our placement is. None of us actually know where we sit. 